Hello, everyone. Welcome to the third video of our webinar series, Pass or Fail, Assessing Assessment. Uh, I'm Alicia Modena, and here with me today are Anlor Lival and Ben Christensen to talk about how we can use the Council of Europe competence butterfly uh, to uh, carry out assessments in our history lessons. Uh, so uh, very, very briefly about our speakers. Anne-Laure is a, a teacher from France and she is also a Euroclio ambassador and a member of the Euroclio board. And Benny uh, comes from Denmark and he is also a Euroclio ambassador and a member of the Historiana Teaching and Learning team where he recently brought the, uh, well, the butterfly competence to the attention of the team. Um, so yeah, I think we can start. I am going to put the butterfly on the screen. Great. Um, Benny, why don't you tell us a little bit, you know, what's the butterfly and- Yeah, and its background. I'll do that, exactly. thank you. Well, um, actually all this started um, in an initiative from Andorra during its chairmanship of the Council of Europe Committee of Ministers in 2013. And after some years of work, a project group published three volumes of reference framework and the butterfly model was introduced for the first time in 2016. And the Council of Europe actually still works on ex expanding the competences for democratic culture over all sec sectors of education systems. If we look at the butterfly, as you can see, it contains 20 competences structured in four dimensions, illustrated as a butterfly, and each dimension has its wing. Um, a little bit more about this uh, from uh, some of the publications of the Council of Europe. The butterfly model is not intended for use by education policymakers, especially those working within ministries of education and by education practitioners from preschool through primary and secondary schooling to higher education, including adult education and vocational education. And this reference framework of competences for democratic culture provides a systematic approach to designing the teaching, the learning, and the assessment of competences for democratic culture and introducing them into formal education systems in ways that are coherent, comprehensive, and transparent. And all subject matters allow for developing the values, attitudes, skills, and knowledge, and critical understanding that we see in the butterfly. So this was the first part. And then for us, it was actually so that history was among the first subjects that the Council of Europe focused upon after developing the first part. The initiative to include history education in the uh, competences for democratic culture was taken by the Council of Europe in 2015. And the main input has come from four regional seminars that were held during the period 2016 to 17 in the framework of the intergovernmental project Educating for Diversity and Democracy, Teaching History in Contemporary Europe. And they brought together government officials and practitioners in history education from all member states and based upon this input, a group of authors produced the report called Quality History Education in the 21st Century, Principles and Guidelines. And this was published in November 2018. And uh, some of the main points um, of this report linking it to the um, competences for democratic culture uh, are that they uh, think that history education can gain from this to create a classroom climate where young people can actively explore historical questions to experience and learn about through and for democratic culture. And this allows for the development of the abilities young people need 
to become active participants of a democratic culture, acquiring a set of behaviors that emphasize dialogue and cooperation, solving conflicts by peaceful means and active participation in public spaces. So that uh, would put us back to having a look at the butterfly. As you can see, as I mentioned, altogether there are 20 uh, competences lined up in uh, these four wings. And um, some of uh, the competences are quite well known to history uh, educators and uh, have been used uh, for a long time. And some of them would be new to many of us and certainly were when uh, this was published for the first time. So from the Council of Europe report, uh, we move on to Euroclew and we'll have a look at how Euroclew um, uh, found a link to our um, uh, work in general. So please, anne Law, would you go on? Yes, Benny. Um, history education has an important role to play in confronting the current political, cultural and social challenges facing Europe, in particular those posed by the uh, increasingly diverse nature of societies, uh, the integration of migrants and refugees into Europe, and by attacks on democracy and democratic values, we can think of populism. History is a specific subject as it provides the answers to critically understand the present by teaching that any feature of the past must be interpreted in its historical context and by raising awareness that historical interpretation is a matter of debate. The thinking processes acquired through the study of history constitute a standard of judgment that is transferable to any subject. Hence, historical critical knowledge and understanding of political, social, cultural, and economical systems intersect with the democratic culture necessary for active citizenship. And Euroclio is convinced of that. So Euroclio has introduced in his manifesto on high quality history, heritage and citizenship education, um, the principles of the, of the butterfly, uh, especially uh, the principle number eight, uh, which state that high quality history, heritage and citizenship education addresses a manifold of human values beliefs, attitudes, and dispositions such as democracy, tolerance, respect for human rights, mutual understanding, social cohesion, solidarity, freedom, courage, equal opportunities and responsibility, but also love and friendship. So Euroclio is trying to work with the, the butterfly today. Thank you, Anne Laure and, and Benny for, yeah, for introducing the butterfly and for telling us a little bit more about not only how the butterfly came to be, but also about what, you know, Euroclio's relationship with, with the butterfly, if you like. Um, before we move on to, yeah, to practical um, tips and tricks for educators on how to use the butterfly, I actually have a question for you, which is, um, yeah, uh, maybe a little bit of background also for the for the viewers. We we have first encountered the butterfly actively in our learning to disagree project, where um, where yeah the the butterfly has been one of the concepts introduced for the design of our lessons. So it's something relatively recent that we started applying. And so I'm wondering, you know, did it change or will it change uh, how you approach your lesson planning and your assessments? Um, I, I mean, this is a question for the both of you. So maybe Benny, uh, will it change how you approach lesson planning and assessment? Yes, <clears throat> when when this came up, um, I think in the, in the Euroclue circles, we moved um, uh, around a bit talking about it, for example, in, in connection with our project on, the, on the diversity. And uh, if we look at it uh, on a more perhaps uh, overall uh, view, um, you could say that uh, will it, should it change our approach to how to, um, to plan lessons and how to assess? So formally, 
we would have to say yes, since this model for uh, competences for democratic culture was actually unanimously approved by the European ministers of education uh, uh, at a meeting of, of the Council of Europe in April 2016. So you could say that all member states of the Council of Europe have formally accepted introducing these uh, principles. But a very important reservation, it was left to each member country how to apply the model. So what happens, we'll see, but at least uh, I think uh, we're trying to, to, to uh, take some initiatives uh, also through this to promote this. And then we could move to something else because um, I think already when you look at uh, many European countries and look at uh, their curricula for history education, you can see in their opening paragraphs where they uh, state their general aims that you can find uh, aims that correspond very well to the butterfly and to the uh, thoughts behind it. I've picked out two examples for you. Um, the first one is from Germany, uh, general aims for history education, as I found them uh, last edited in 2005. Um, and uh, in this, uh, the core identity of history education is mentioned. And uh, I quote, and this is my um, translation, the subject of history strengthens the ability of empathy, offers the possibility of identifying with model persons, but also communicates the ability of critical distance. And last but not least, the subject contributes to a culture of value-based tolerance in a plural society. So this was Germany, 2005. And for uh, my country as well, Denmark, I found last edited 2019, these uh, words uh, expressed like this. The learning environment must be founded on intellectual liberty, equality, and democracy, thus strengthening students' knowledge of and respect for fundamental freedom and human rights in order for them to be qualified for active cooperation in a democratic society. And what about France? Well, in, in France, we have a, a new curriculum for middle school since 2016 and high school since 2019. In middle school, with the new curriculum, we uh, focus more on, uh, much more on skills such as um, digital literacy, analyzing, uh, critical thinking, cooperate and sharing. However, attitude and values are more usually the focus of civic education, which is not always taught by history teachers. So I would say we have this trend in France, it habit to separate knowledge and skills attitude and values. Whereas the butterfly of the Council of Europe make us think of approaches that bring them together. And in civic education, for instance, the focus is made on four learning outcomes, uh, which are sensitivity or empathy, how to express and identify emotions and feelings, the rule and the law, the rules to live together, judgment to discuss moral cho choices, choices of past or present actors, and um, engagement and commitment, um, being autonomous, but also being able to cooperate, being responsible of others. But as you can see, uh, as attitudes and values are separate, are usually separates from knowledge and skills, um, more practiced in civic education than in history. In high school, the new 2019 curriculum state that history and geography, well, because you know in France we teach both history and geography, uh, show to the students how the choices of present and past actors have an influence on the society. They have to educate to liberty and responsibility. History helps to build a civic education and a common culture. And the purpose, well, the aim is to raise, um, to educate responsible citizens with critical thinking skills 
and make them aware of values, knowledge, and common historical markers. One last thing, more assessment is too often perceived as uh, a way to provide marks for students. We have pressure from the school system, from the parents, from the students to provide marks because they are used to that and for the final exam. But assessment is not only about marks. So I think the plus of working with the butterfly and trying to tie the four competencies can help to move away from marks and maybe prioritize other um, learning outcomes and competencies. Thank you, Anne-Laure. Yeah, um, just as an aside, yeah, uh, assessment perceived as a, as a way to provide marks is also something that Ute in the past video uh, highlighted. She, she had a couple of, of slides, especially about how you can conduct assessment without uh, marking, giving a grade to your students, which I believed was, yeah, it's a very, very important point. And yeah, this, um, this wanting a mark, um, both on the part of the schools and on the parents and on the students, well, I, I think we can consider that one of the obstacles to the, to the implementation of the butterfly. And I know, I know, Benny, that you you looked into what could be other potential obstacles to the implementation of the butterfly. Well, I think generally that the um, uh, yes to back up what and Law just said that that uh, I think many history teachers will experience quite a huge gap between the general aims of the curriculum and the daily life in classrooms and. Uh, uh, at examinations, just as you mentioned, and law. So how to come about uh, including attitudes and values in their classroom practice, especially in their assessment practice. This is something um, that uh, very many teachers would not uh, have the chance to engage upon, I think, because this is not a tradition. So this was actually also uh, what uh, the authors of the Council of Europe uh, report on history education uh, thought a bit about. What about the butterfly? How, how could we apply it into uh, a daily practice when uh, it comes to assessment methods? Um, and uh, they say, I've just one small quote, that assessment practices should be in agreement with the norms and values of an education that aims to strengthen and promote democratic values and respect for human dignity and human rights. And again, a fairly broad statement. And what then? So I think we are here now when we approach uh, what this webinar uh, uh, will uh, focus on to offer uh, some input and some ideas on how to use the butterfly for assessment in, in history education, right? To, to help us in this, in this conversation, we have actually created a grid um, that we can use to sort of categorize um, the competences of the Council of Europe and all the aspects of assessment that, well, that we could think of. Uh, so I am now sharing the, the empty grid. Um, Benny, you, you're the mind behind this grid. So uh, can you tell us a little bit more about it? Well, yes, it's a way of trying, I think, to, uh, to show um, how we could do this, how it could be done. Um, we uh, made this grid, as you can see, uh, in the way that uh, horizontally we get the four wings of the butterfly, knowledge, skills, attitudes and values. And then vertically, uh, the uh, assessment uh, called summative that most of us are used to and the formative one in the next part. And uh, in general terms, you can say that the summative assessment uh, is to to grade, to evaluate students learning at the end of an instructional unit by comparing it against some standard or benchmark or set of criteria. 
where the focus is on the achievement of the learning outcomes of the curriculum or the syllabus, and uh, often ending up by marks. And the other one, the formative in B, is more about validating the teaching and learning process and not to grade students. And um, for a start, we will concentrate on the A and B. And then later on during this session, uh, and Laura and I will also approach uh, uh, the part C, how to use this butterfly for lesson planning. Uh, at the bottom, you can also see um, three ways of um, assessing. Normally, most commonly to all of us is that we assess individual students. Sometimes we assess groups and group work, and sometimes we assess the whole class. Um, uh, how did it work? Uh, what would the class think about what happened and so on? So uh, if we move from the empty grid, if you got the main points, then, and Laura, would you take over? Yes, Benny. So um, usually, well, most of the teachers uh, are more familiar with um, assessing knowledge and skills, so column one and two. And uh, usually, again, uh, most of the teachers are more familiar with summative um, assessment, with uh, organizing, yes, test or exam to, to yes, grade or rank students. So we have, uh, we wanted to provide uh, um, examples of, um, of uh, assessment and questions that can be used to, to exemplify the, the butterfly and the four uh, competencies, the uh, four wings of the butterfly. So if you look at these um, sticky notes, as you can see, well, our well, lesson example would be something about the making or the building of the European Union, the history of the European Union. And um, so usually you can also read this grid, um, well, starting from the bottom up, uh, starting with formative and then going to summative assessment, because formative assessment are supposed to be um, yes a starting point or um, a step a milestone and then uh, each teacher usually build a summative assessment later so you can read this grid from the bottom up or from the top to the bottom or as you want to to so if we look at the first two columns we have in uh, the column uh, a1 examples of uh, um, questions for ex individual students. So, for example, uh, a question for um, assessing the knowledge about the, uh, the EU and what has been uh, studied as um, key events of the making of the EU. So, when was the treaty on the establishment of the EU signed? Okay, it could be a question for an individual uh, students, individual students. And um, in the same box, uh, another question, maybe more for, for the whole class, would be uh, what were the goals of the EU? So more uh, broader or general questions. But this summative um, assessment, well, is supposed to come after um, a first lesson or a hour about the, uh, the making of the EU. And before that, before reaching that part, uh, what we should do, and we don't always do, um, is uh, trying to get the students to go there uh, with formative assessments. So we could start the lesson with uh, this uh, uh, question uh, in the uh, box B1, uh, a general question before starting the lesson, before, well, well opening the lesson. Uh, a question we could be, um, yes, something, a short test on paper or uh, something that you, uh, you ask the students to write the answer on a sticky note. What is the EU for you? What do you know about the EU? You know, to, to just have an idea of what are there maybe a common knowledge about the EU and what, um, what they, they don't know, what are their misconceptions maybe or stereotypes, prejudice, prejudices about the EU. 
But formative assessment uh, is also something that uh, needs some feedback to help the students, uh, well, improve and be uh, more at ease with uh, skills, knowledge, values, attitudes. So the formative assessment needs some feedback from the teacher or from the other students. So can peer assessment can be really helpful to uh, help the students uh, uh, move uh, forward. And formative assessment is also mean that the student has to think of his um, or her own uh, progress and what can um, be done to uh, improve his uh, or her uh, learning. Now, if we move to column number two, uh, skills that we usually, or of course, already uh, assess and we know how to assess them. You have other examples. So in uh, column uh, B2, so we have an example of um, a question for formative assessment about um, historical skills. Uh, that you can find in the in the butterfly, for example, observe the two um, sources and find similarities and uh, differences. So it's a um, well, basic question that you uh, all know. But if you want to uh, prepare a summative assessment about skills after another lesson, you uh, would want the students to go further. So of course, you're going to ask them to compare the two sources, but also to uh, argue uh, and discuss which one is the more uh, reliable, for example, which one is biased, why is it biased or not, and if you can trust or not uh, the source but um, and justify why. And uh, if we uh, look at the, the last uh, line of this grid about uh, lesson planning, as you can see, we have added some uh, very short sticky notes. Uh, when you are planning, of course, um, your, well, the, the assessment about knowledge, either formative or summative, uh, when you're planning le your lesson, of course, you are thinking of what concepts, what keywords you want the students to, to master at, at the end of the lesson, what key events, what key actors or actresses you, you will have to, to talk during your, your lesson. And for skills, of course, you will have to uh, identify and think what skills you want them to, to practice and to train for, like uh, if they want, if you want them to work on historical sources, critical thinking and cooperation skills, if you want them to uh, do some group work and maybe share some ideas and also uh, practice some peer assessment um, in, in the group. Okay, uh, so I think Ben is going to talk to you about uh, columns three and four about what is maybe more um, new with the butterfly, that is attitudes and values and how to assess them. Yes, thank you. Yes, I think uh, the butterfly in that way um, um, offers some, some challenges to, to us as history educators. I mean, in general, at least in, in my daily practice, you had in mind always uh, sort of the the three steps, uh, knowledge, what we would call skills then, and then uh, competences. But uh, since the butterfly looks at this in quite another way, as also stating that the acquirement of knowledge is of course also a competence, um, it, it, it sort of broadens the field. And I find this uh, actually very attractive. So if we look at um, the, um, the grid again, and say that uh, let's try to look at attitudes in connection with summative assessment. So, for example, for group work, uh, you could put a question like this, to what degree did the, this lesson make us more aware of what is important when trying to understand and respect viewpoints on a sensitive historical topic? Um, and um this goes even further of course when we uh, move to values um which is i think the field 
uh, of the butterfly that um, history educators would be, well, most hesitant about including for various reasons, uh, certain principles that uh, at least one of the other webinars will, uh, will deal with. So you might put a question here to again, that could be the whole class for a class discussion. Why valuing cultural diversity is important to promote democracy and fairness? Or how can we improve our history lessons to include minorities or other groups we didn't talk about? So in that way, um, we try to sort of um, um, stop here and look at what did we do and uh, can we move on from this? And this becomes, of course, even more um, market when we turn to uh, B, the formative part. And uh, again, if we look at the values in the, in the next part, you might have then again a class discussion. How can we use this lesson in our future work with common values like justice, fairness, and human rights? So meaning that you include the students in uh, what we'll uh, turn to in a moment in the lesson planning so they feel they're engaged and that their experiences are valued and used um, for uh, their own reflections uh, and also for the use of um, the class as such and for the use of their further history education, which I think is a very good idea and something that uh, this uh, butterfly a model could really uh, emphasize. Um, and again, something that many of us would find uh, a bit unusual. So um, perhaps enough about these examples and uh, let's move on to this, the last part of the grid, the, um, the uh, part where we talk about um, the lesson planning. Could we return to that for a moment to the grid? Yes, because this was something we talked about as well. Uh, and and Law, you already mentioned uh, that uh, for most of us, when we plan lessons, well, what do we have in front of us? We have the textbook and uh, what would be the main content and the main uh, challenges of the next lesson and the next lesson. We may build up a new topic that is going to be covered over the next eight, 10 lessons. And again, traditionally, we'll be thinking about um, what knowledge must be acquired and what traditional skills must be included because we know the students will need that for examination purposes. I think it's more unusual for us to start out um, developing our lesson planning based on assessment as such, and then from the assessment part, building, constructing the lesson, including uh, knowledge and skills elements. So in the uh, lesson planning, in the C, and we move to three attitudes. There's one example here that the teacher might sit in his or her study, putting this question. How can I plan the lesson so that Peter, Paul and Mary will present their attitudes to migration and argue for them. I think most of us will know the situation. We have a number of students that are normally very quiet and it's very difficult to make them active. And especially if you want to, to make them say something uh, on, on uh, levels of, uh, of uh, history education that go beyond uh, reproduction of knowledge or uh, working with skills. So this is one way of doing lesson planning. And uh, if we go a step further to values, number four, this becomes more general then. Uh, how can I develop the lesson so that value and cultural diversity will be the focus point of the lesson? Again, this might come up because in your curriculum, you will know that there are some um, elements of this, as we saw in the general aims, that somehow you must cover some values 
um, according to the general aims of the curriculum. And again, then, so how come about this? By planning a lesson, starting out with the assessment part and then building the other elements into it. And this again, I think is quite new to, to all of us, but I see really some very good opportunities using the butterfly um, in the future for this. Thank you. Thank you, Benny. Um, so um, as we said at the beginning, we would like also to show a couple of practical examples on uh, how, well, how Benny and Anlor uh, used the butterfly to plan their own lesson. Now Anlor's example should be visible. Okay, yes, so this is, um, um, yes, based on a lesson that you can find on Historiana, which was uh, created for the Learning to Disagree um, project. So it's about um, the Algerian war independence. And so you can find the, well, some of the documents on uh, Historiana. So uh, yes, I, I decided to, to switch formative and summative assessment because uh, formative is supposed to be um, yes, a step leading to summative assessment. Um, so you have some examples based on that topic that is uh, well highly sensitive and uh, that we teach uh, in, uh, in the French curriculum in uh, high school, but also in, uh, in middle school. So um, for um, yes, knowledge for one, the first um, wing or dimension of the butterfly about knowledge. Um, with a, as a formative assessment, you could start with, um, yes, a kind of self-assessment by the student, uh, asking um, the student what does he know or what does she know about the uh, Algerian law of independence? Uh, what is it or what keywords come to his or her mind um, speaking about that uh, because well we often talk about that in, in well in the news especially uh, this year and next year and um, using the learning to disagree um, activities uh, you could use an um, exit card um, or warm-up activity to to organize this uh, self-assessment uh, and the step further would be to, um, to create um, a more broad or general question um, and to think of uh, the word uh, war and the word independence. So after the lesson, the, the students should be able to explain or try to think why should we call it a war of independence instead of a revolution or a war. So this is a, um, well, some critical thinking about uh, the words that are important to, to use and it depends also on which side of uh, the Mediterranean you, you live uh, in. Um, skills, so as you could see in the, in the jam board, in the grid with the jam board, um, well, of course, what is very important is to work with the comparison of the viewpoints, comparison of um, sources. So it could be a comparison between um, the official French, um, a French reaction to um, the events of uh, November the 1st, well, the beginning of this uh, war, this conflict, what was the, the declaration made by um, ministers from the French government. And one of them quite famous at the time was François Mitterrand. And uh, with um, the, uh, the motivations and the, the declaration made by um, the National Liberation Front who organized uh, the, uh, the uh, attacks uh, in November, 1954. Um, and to help the student to do that, the teacher should, yes, give, of course, his or her feedback and, uh, and maybe ask the student, what do you need to, to do or to think of when you want to compare two different sources? So think of what is important to, to take into account when you compare uh, two different sources 
and uh, explain maybe their uh, viewpoints. Um, and for the summative assessment, uh, it would be to go, yes, a step further and take, uh, ask about the context and the background. How can the context in 1954 for the French government, for the uh, Algerian independentist, what is different in this context and what can explain that it happens in 1954 and not before and not later? And, um, and that uh, what can explain to, uh, these different interpretations of the situation in France and in Algeria in 1954. But what is important, what is in interesting with this topic uh, is more about values and attitudes because knowledge and skills, well, you can do that, uh, yes. Uh, very easily, you are used to do that, you are used to practice that. So uh, I would like to focus on attitudes. So the idea would be maybe to think of um, the French response to these um, attacks in 1954, but the French government response and uh, maybe other uh, French uh, actors' uh, responses. Uh, like um, in the Learning to Disagree project, we um, created a collection of viewpoints and uh, I had examples of viewpoints of people, French, well, European from Algeria, uh, who decided to uh, not um, obey to the French government and to uh, disobey and to uh, support uh, the um, Algerian nationalist um, actions like Henri Maillot or Fernand Ifto, Ifton, who was um, sentenced to death uh, during the Algerian War of Independence. And it was quite a shock because he was the first uh, European uh, sentenced to death and indeed um, executed, not an Algerian, a European law. So um, the students, could in group and then they could discuss in group um, and also um, receive the feedback of their classmates. Uh, how do you understand, um, well, the different actors because there are many, many, many actors in this conflict. It's not just one side, there's just another side. And uh, more important, their motivations in this conflict to discuss uh, the attitudes and how uh, can someone react in such uh, um, a situation and uh, and why should someone act like that and not follow the, the mainstream? And uh, for the summative assessment, it would be a reflection about the lesson. How does the lesson help me to understand the complexity of a war, any war, and the choices of people, because what is important is to understand that history is about complexity, and it's um, and you can make some connection with um, with the news, uh, what is happening today. And well, I'm just thinking about uh, demonstrations in France against the sanitary pass and the, the obligation to get uh, vaccination, and that people make a comparison with. Um, the yellow star that uh, Jews had to wear during World War II and uh, I'll make a comparison with the uh, totalitarian regime during World War II and Nazism. So it's not that simple and uh, you should think of that. And for values, um, so for the formative assessment, so what did this lesson teach us about the value of human rights? human rights uh, in everywhere in the world, not only in uh, metropolitan France, uh, justice, equality, because um, decolonization is about justice and equality and the rule of law. Um, and so this assessment would be made uh, in the whole class or in groups. And again, um, can be very, um, well, could be enriched by peer assessment. Uh, I think you can collect some, uh, some ideas and some uh, uh, viewpoints and reflection from the students to build something uh, uh, with the whole class or 
groups by groups. And as a summative assessment, uh, a more complex question would be how does this lesson help us understand the consequences of this war in French and also in the Algerian society uh, today? Because it's still, um, well, there are still, of course, some, it's still a hot topic and there are still some questions um, to be uh, to be discussed and some, of course, disagreements about um, the dates or places or other things between um, the two. Uh, the two, and then, of course, you can make uh, bridges with other topics of the curriculum and other conflicts, uh, which could help students to yes make links with uh, the other chapters or lessons, and, and that is something difficult for them to, to do. So that's one example. Thank you, Anne-Laure, for sharing this example. I believe that if I click here, Ben's example will appear. Look at that. Yes, thank you. Um, now, as you saw, we, we got a very nice and, and very full example of how to plan during um, uh, what Anne-Laure just uh, told us. Uh, very convincing and, and I see it full of, of logic and, uh, and uh, really um, an example that uh, could be transferred, I think, to, to many other topics. Um, what I, uh, because we had this grid already from Man Law, I uh, uh, decided to, to spell it out in some lines instead. Now, what I've got here builds on um, four. Um, learning activities that I'm just now fini finishing developing and they will be uploaded on Historiana in a month's time or two. Um, what I uh, chose to do was to um, develop four uh, learning activities on the same topic, the topic of the German refugees to Denmark in 1945 to 49. And in each of the, the four learning activities, I focus on one of the butterfly wings. But again, as we said, uh, it is a cluster of competences. It's a holistic uh, uh, approach. We have to do that. So um, here I uh, um, made the examples of uh, my focus on, uh, on values. So my example here um, uh, runs like this. The teacher wants to focus on valuing human dignity and human rights and on valuing democracy, justice, and fairness. And um, the short description of the activity, based on some pages of historical knowledge of the topic, students will analyze viewpoints on the topic with a focus on the values expressed. Students will then discuss and conclude to what extent they can understand and accept the values expressed, and to what extent their own values can be used in studying a period of the past. Um, I'll just um, make a short note here. Why did I choose this topic? German refugees to Denmark, 1945 to, 1945, uh, to 1949. Well, sometimes it's still a topic that comes up. Uh, at the time, it was a hot topic, of course. Uh, we suffered during the war. Why should we treat the German refugees in a nice way? So from uh, some background knowledge and some contemporary sources, uh, the students uh, will work on, on uh, various attitudes to this uh, in the past. But in the same way that uh, Anne Lord just alluded to what happens in France now, uh, there's still a big debate going on in Denmark about how we treat uh, the Syrian refugees that came to us um, from um, 16, uh, 2016, 17, 18, especially. And uh, in uh, this debate, uh, history is often used as uh, uh, arguments or ammunition. and one of the topics that uh, um, people who, uh, who discuss this actually use is the way we treated the German uh, refugees. So therefore, again, uh, the use and misuse of history 
is an important part um, to um, pull in and to make uh, clear to students, especially when it comes to values. So um, this was why I, um, I selected this. So uh, the last part, I've already said that, uh, that um, the competences, knowledge and critical understanding of history and analytical and critical thinking skills um, are included in the cluster of competences for this particular, uh, particular learning activity. Again, exemplifying that uh, uh, for building uh, a good learning activity, we'll ha we have to, to move uh, via uh, more than one wing of the butterfly. Thank you. And thank you, Benny, also for sharing with us your example. I, I have made a note that when the learning activities will be published, we will add them to the description of the, well, of the YouTube video together with, you can already find in the description of the YouTube video, the um, extract of the board so that if you want, you can use the grid that we have developed yourselves to, to help plan your lessons. And let's say starting from October, 2021, more or less, you will be able to find in the description below also the um, learning activities that Benny developed, as well as the learning activity on the Algerian war that Anlor referred to. Um, well, I think we've touched already upon quite a lot of meat uh, when it comes to the butterfly of competences. Uh, I just have a last question um, just to, to cap our discussion off, which is um, if the viewers go home with only one piece of advice, what do you think this piece of advice should be? What do you think is the most important piece of advice that you can give a history teacher who wants to use the butterfly in their daily practice? Alor, let's switch it up. <laughs> Yeah, well, um, I would say that um, when you're planning your lesson, you need to, well, you know that you need to scaffold the learning um, activities and outcomes. And that, yes, maybe don't be afraid of the butterfly and adapt the butterfly to the lesson. So the butterfly is flexible again, and you can choose to focus more on one of the wing of the butterfly. Uh, even, of course, if you if you mix, you know, a bunch of competencies uh, during your, your lesson. So that would be my advice. Thank you. And Benny? Well, since this is new to, to most of us, at least the, uh, the attitudes and values part, it will be new to our students as well. So my advice is to engage the students also in the planning of the lessons saying, well, I'm a bit hesitant about this. We're going to plan uh, and construct a topic uh, for teaching over the next weeks. This is a butterfly. What do you suggest we do based on your experiences so far? As it's often the best advice we get uh, are from our students. So I think the butterfly is a very good opportunity to engage them in the planning and assessment also on the, uh, of the lessons. Great. I, I think these are both great advices. Don't be scared. Don't be afraid. And let in your students on the secret behind assessment. Uh, I would have liked if my teachers had let me in on the secret of assessment, for example. So definitely great. Well, thank you both so much for recording this video with us on this yeah, beautiful and sunny July morning and for preparing that with us during your vacation. Um, thank you for to all people that have been watching the video. Next week, we will be publishing the last pre-recorded video, which will be about the use of rubrics in assessment and the use of rubrics for differentiated learning. We've already recorded it, so I can already say that it's gonna be amazing. Um, and Lauren Benny, thank you so, so much for being here with us today. And uh, I hope we can host you to make another recording soon. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>